And now, Doc Talk, brought to you by Plateau Medical Center. Here's Dr. Paul Connolly. Hello, I'm Dr. Paul Connolly, and thank you for tuning in to another episode of Doc Talk. Uh, we're actually on location here uh, with Dr. Andrew Peterson in this clinic, and we're going to be talking to you folks a little bit today about allergic rhinitis as well as sinusitis. So allergic rhinitis actually affects approximately 20% of the U.S. population, where sinusitis affects approximately 15% of the United States population. This actually accounts for approximately 30, per, 30 million actually cases annually, and actually is uh, one of the largest healthcare costs uh, that we see in the United States. So tonight we're going to have Dr. Andrew Peterson, who's actually going to kind of talk to us a little bit about the differences between allergic rhinitis and sinusitis, and we're going to talk about how we work these folks up and treat these folks. So Dr. Peterson, thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for having me, Dr. Conley. Excited. So first of all, you know, I want to uh, just ask you this, okay? Um, you know, when we talk about otolaryngology or ENT, can you tell me a little bit what is an ENT doctor and what all does ENT mean? Sure, yeah. It's a mouthful that a lot of people have trouble with. Uh, ENT, ear, nose, and throat um, specialist, takes care of lots of head and neck pathologies that people see. It's a pretty broad ranging uh, medical specialty that includes both uh, medical clinic care as well as surgical care. Um, it, uh, it ranges from pediatric to geriatric age populations. Um, and um, certainly uh, nasal sinus pathologies are common uh, complaints. That is a, a big part of what I do, but it also expands outside of that. Um, ear pathologies, uh, thyroid issues, salivary gland pathologies, skin cancer. Um, so pretty much head and neck, right? Head ear, and neck. ear, nose, and throat, right? ENT. Correct. So, you know, so obviously with ENT, and we think about, you know, especially here in West Virginia, you know, uh, where we're from, you know, we always thinking about, you know, seasonal allergies, you know, we all kind of know it's coming in the springtime of the year, you know, when the snow starts to melt and the, you know, flowers start blooming and then all of a sudden we start seeing on the news, like, you know, pollen counts and things like that. We start saying, okay, here we go. Here we're coming in like allergy season. And so, you know, when we talk about allergies, maybe you can tell us a little bit about maybe the similarities but also the differences between seasonal allergies and then what we talk about sinuses or sinusitis. Maybe you can uh, tell us a little bit about what the difference is and, and what that means. Sure, that's a, that's a great question and uh, something that I'm doing on a daily basis. Um, so allergic rhinitis is a inflammatory disease of the lining of the nose and that's where the immune system uh, inappropriately creates too much response to an allergen that they might be exposed to. Um, that could include a uh, pet like cat and dog dander or perhaps uh, a tree pollen like poplar trees. Um, these are things that most people are exposed to very frequently uh, but some people create much more allergic response to these which uh, creates their symptoms. Um, compare this to sinusitis or chronic sinusitis. This is an inflammatory disease of the sinuses which surround the nose itself. These often begin as infectious problems, but then transition into inflammatory problems as well. And this is more characterized as facial pain and pressure, uh, thick nasal drainage, nasal congestion, trouble breathing through the nose, maybe even a little bit of a lack of sense of smell. Um, and um, it's a very different pathology. And while there is a lot of overlap between the two, um, they're, they're different and it's important to distinguish the two apart. You know, one of the things, you know, I hear people talking about is they talk about, you know, I, I, have, I have sinuses, you know, and obviously we in healthcare as physicians don't get why everyone has sinuses. So, so when, when we think about that, I was thinking about, you know, someone that's sneezing or, or they say they have hay fever, and that's more, that's more the allergic type of, of I guess, uh, s symptomatology then? Sure, yeah. Uh, sneezing, itchy, watery eyes, um, those are definitely allergy type symptoms um, compared to the facial pain and pressure and thick uh, discolored drainage of chronic sinusitis like I mentioned. Um, yeah. So when you when you talk about um, you know, these conditions, because you know, I know um, you know, I'll have patients, you know, even coming to my office, and they'll talk about, you know, yeah, doc, you know, my sinuses are acting up. I, I just need, 
you know, an antibiotic, okay? And I think a lot of people kind of reach for that. And obviously, you talk about it can be non-infectious causing. You're talking about, you know, pet dander, or maybe if you have carpet in your house or, or you maybe even how you, like, you know, heat your home. You know, these are all things. So, so we're talking about, like, typically, like, you know, when we talk about treatment, you know, for these, and so maybe folks out there don't always just, you know, grab for an antibiotic. How, how um, do we typically treat these conditions once we kind of like tease out and kind of dissect out like what the problem actually is? Sure. Well, I mean, that, that's where it's most important to discern what exactly is going on. Um, antibiotic usage is certainly uh, prevalent and overused when it comes to treating uh, nasal pathologies. Like you said, many uh, uh, patients will complain of having sinuses. That, that's true. Sinuses are anatomic structures that all people have. It's when they become a problem uh, that we see symptoms. Um, so step one is to properly diagnose the difference between these things. Uh, the best way to do that is to see a healthcare professional who has expertise in the topic. Um, in, in my situation, I'm often using nasal endoscopy, which is uh, a high definition camera in the nose as one of my diagnostic tools to evaluate. And uh, today's a great episode because we're gonna uh, do a little demonstration with that later today and uh, take a look inside of your nose. Um, in addition to that, we often use radiography with using CT scans to look at the sinuses. And we kind of put all of those things together to create a whole picture um, to help distinguish allergies versus sinusitis versus other uh, nasal pathologies. We, we treat these very differently. Allergies are treated with uh, medical allergy treatments and these are a lot of medications that are over the counter that perhaps most of you have tried at home. Nasal sprays, eye drops, oral antihistamines like cetirizine and loratadine. Um, these are all great treatments. Uh, we sometimes do allergy testing and move into immunotherapy as a treatment for allergies, which includes allergy shots, sublingual immunotherapy, or, or, or others. Very different than chronic sinusitis, uh, which is treated uh, sometimes with antibiotics, but not always, uh, oral steroids, and ultimately, uh, sometimes we need to consider surgical options, um, which are which can be done both in the office as well as in the operating room, uh, operating room setting. The, 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 the era of sinus surgery has advanced a lot over the past 10 years where uh, 10 years ago sinus surgery was very destructive and aggressive surgery and there's lots of horror stories of patient experience with that. And uh, nowadays it's a more minimally invasive conservative approach aimed at avoiding damage to structures that don't need to be uh, damaged. And there's even a lot of sinus surgeries and procedures that we can do with you wide awake here in the office. So when we talk about, um, again, some of these uh, nasal sprays, I mean, basically, that's basically topically treating, I guess, the, the nose so you don't have this histamine, you know, release. And then we, you know, we talk about histamines and we think about antihistamines, but some of the ones you mentioned are like some of the non- uh, sedating, you know, histamines out there, um, which I think that's, you know, important that you're actually trying to treat, um, you know, uh, that that allergen, and that's why allergies is an allergen uh, triggering that. Um, and I do think, you know, you know, with, you know, we think about in healthcare, we think about antibiotic stewardship. You know, we with a term out there, we're trying to make sure that you know you have the right diagnosis, that you're not being placed on an antibiotic that you don't need, because ultimately that can cause um, multi-drug resistant, these super bugs that are out there, it can cause also, you know, other issues. You know, in my world, you know, diarrhea, you can get, you know, thrush, yeast in the mouth from, from antibiotics. So I think, you know, folks watching the show, you know, make sure that, uh, you know, you're talking to a, a physician to make sure, you know, do you have an infectious sinusitis, you know, versus an allergic rhinitis, because I think sometimes it's hard to tell. The difference, and when we talk about, you know, infections that can cause some, you know, ear, nose, and throat issues, you know, right now we're currently undergoing a, uh, you know, pandemic and, uh, you know, with, with COVID-19. You know, one of the things I hear about all the time, Dr. Peterson, is I hear about, you know, this, uh, this anosmia or, or this lack of taste or lack of sense of smell. Um, maybe you can just touch base a little bit about, you know, how, th how that works and how that presents and how if someone has that, you know, how they differentiate that between, you know, maybe a COVID-19 manifestation uh, versus uh, some other, you know, uh, allergic rhinitis. Sure, that's a great question and uh, very pertinent uh, amidst our current pandemic. Um, 
Anosmia is the lack of sense of smell or total loss of sense of smell. And while there are uh, ENT conditions that can cause that, it is not that common to see total loss of smell. Um, early on with the COVID-19 pandemic, we, we started seeing cases of anosmia with lots of sense of smell and initially thought that those were more outliers. But over time, we learned that that's actually a common presenting symptom of the disease. Um, most people don't know loss of sense of smell can occur with multiple viruses, upper respiratory viruses, but it appears that it's pretty common with COVID-19. Um, I, I would tell patients that if you experience loss of sense of smell and you don't have a great explanation of why otherwise, especially under the current pandemic, that could be the presenting symptom and it would be a reason to speak up to your healthcare provider and uh, potentially get tested. So and that's, that's, you know, it's really interesting, you know, because we think about all the different manifestations um, and so many of the things, you know, that uh, we see, you know, are, are things, you know, in your, you know, basically in your field. Um, so I guess, you know, you know, you know, we're here in your office, okay, obviously you can see, you know, we're actually in your clinic. So there's a lot of things, you know, I think that, you know, as an ear, nose, and throat, you know, you don't just treat sinuses, you don't just treat, you know, sinusitis and allergies, but you actually do surgery, right? And there's uh, office-based procedures that you do as well as like operating room procedures that you do um, in, the, in the hospital. So tell me just a little bit about like some of the office-based or things that you can do uh, procedure-wise here in your clinic. Sure, yeah. So uh, part of my standard examination with, with many patients uh, includes some sort of a camera to get an in-depth look into the nose, into the throat, uh, looking at the voice box. These are areas that we can't just perform a good physical exam with the naked eye. So uh, using various cameras uh, that are that are displayed on a screen are, as part of that uh, exam. And that's uh, th those are kind of the simple procedures that we do here. Um, on top of that, there are lots of uh, in-office procedures that we do ear-related ones, which include ear tubes that can be done in the office under local anesthesia alone. Um, certainly skin pathologies, small skin cancers can be removed in the office. And then more recently, we have uh, stepped more and more into in-office sinus procedures. And those are surgeries that are done here in the office with patients wide awake, where we anesthetize the nose and get them under good, adequate local anesthesia. And we're able to achieve a lot of the same goals of an OR-based sinus surgery with a patient here in the, in the office setting with no general anesthesia, much, more, much less blood loss, and a much easier recovery and quicker return to their lives. So in saying that, you know, um, we're actually going to demonstrate what you can do here in the clinic. And so uh, I think that's going to be something that you folks are going to want to watch because um, after the break, Dr. Peterson is actually going to perform a sinus exam on myself right here in his office. So uh, you guys stay tuned and we're going to take a little commercial break. And when we come back, we'll be right back to where Doc Doc going to do a sinus exam. At Plateau Medical Center, we have the newest technology, which is robotic surgery. Prior to us getting it, you would have to travel out of the area into a larger hospital. By using the robot, less pain, quicker recovery time, quicker return to normal activities, and shorter hospital stays. This new robotic platform allows us to do what we do and do it even better, and that's only going to benefit our patients. It's not about the technology, it's not about the robot, it's about patient outcomes. And now, Doc Talk, brought to you by Plateau Medical Center. Here's Dr. Paul Connolly. Welcome back. I'm Dr. Paul Connolly, and you're watching Doc Talk. And we are currently at Dr. Andrew Peterson's clinic, and he's actually getting ready to perform a sinus exam with me. And he's going to demonstrate uh, the structures of science. He's actually going to be able to look at. Uh, my nose and look at different pathologists. So I guess we're going to find out what all is up in there, right, Dr. Peterson? That's correct. Thank you uh, for uh, being our patient um, today. Tell me if I'm in the right position and everything here. I've never had this yeah. done before. You're great like you are. So this is 
a uh, standard part of uh, multiple examinations that I do on a daily basis. Very easy exam. Uh, I'm first going to spray your nose with two separate sprays. Uh, one is a decongestant designed to help open up the nose. And then the second one is a little bit of a numbing spray just to make the exam that much easier. Um, we'll then use this camera and take a look inside the nose and uh, be looking for any different pathologies that you might have and uh, we'll see how deviated your septum might be or if, uh, if you have any pathology that so we need to talk about. So you're going to be talking for an operation, I understand. We could be. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let me spray your nose first. Um, this is the first nasal spray. You have a tissue in your hand, that's great. I have my tissue. Great. Right All right, so here's our first spray. You don't need to do anything. I'll kind of spray in. Great, you can take a little sniff in through the nose now. This is totally painless for those watching. I didn't feel a thing. Here comes spray number two. This is our uh, topical numbing spray. I like numbing. <laughs> Good. You can take a little sniff in now and just kind of let those let those sprays uh, move around and work in your nose for a moment. We'll kind of uh, let those work before we move too fast here. And so this is something that you can do in your in your clinic when you come in for an examination. I mean, basically this is part of the exam. I, I do this multiple times every day. And this would be part of a initial consultation for any type of sinus or nasal complaint that uh, that we would see. Get our camera all the way ready. And what we'll do is while I'm in there, I'll kind of just narrate a little bit of anatomy just to demonstrate to the viewers what we're seeing. Um, you shouldn't feel any pain throughout this, uh, but it can tickle a little bit or, you know, just aware that I'm there inside the nose. You're in great position like you are. Like I tell my patients, you can breathe through your nose or your mouth, whatever's most comfortable for you. Um, and you can keep your eyes open. If you get scared and want to close your eyes, that's okay too. And uh, I'm not scared. Okay, great. <laughs> I'm kind of scared what you're going to find up there. You're probably going well, to find something. Yeah. I want to go to the operating room. We, we, so we'll be on TV. You'll be able to see the, my septum and the sinus. Great. We'll, we'll be looking at your septum. We'll be looking at the turbinates. Um, we'll kind of look up to where the opening to the sinuses are. Um, we'll be looking for any polyps, anything of that nature. So we'll go ahead and uh, start with the camera. All right, great. So we'll make sure our camera's in focus, and it is. So you're in a great position just like you are, just kind of position you right there. All right, great. So first we're in the left side of your nose, and things look really good. You do not need to be nervous at all. So on the Who says I'm nervous? <laughs> so on the <laughs> left side of the screen, we see your septum. On the right side of the screen, we see your inferior turbinate. Uh, the septum should be a nice straight structure, and we can see you do have a little bit of a, uh, a, a very mild deviation over to the side, and we can see that. We can look under the inferior turbinate. That looks good there. We're going to come up high. Now that's the middle turbinate. That is not a polyp. Um, that's underneath of that is where the opening to the sinuses are. We're looking right at the opening to the cheek sinus. That area looks really good. There's no polyps, no major swelling that's there or anything uh, of, uh, of major uh, concern. Let's switch over to the right side of your nose. Again, we've got your septum on the right side of the screen. It's a little more irregular over here. We can see you've got this large ledge, an indentation. I don't know if you uh, maybe bumped your nose, broke it playing baseball back in high school or anything, but... A there, lot of falls. I had a lot of falls. There, there could be a little bit of evidence that, that we're seeing here. Inferior turbinate down low. Let's go up high towards the sinuses. There's that middle turbinate again, looking towards the opening of the cheek sinus, which is under that. And we can even kind of peek to the very back of the nose, which is where the eustachian tube is, which uh, enters into the ear. And uh, overall, I'd say you've got a, a, a nice nasal exam. A little bit of a... So I'm not exciting. You're not exciting, no, no which is always no, a good thing in medicine. I hope you find something. You, you have a little bit of a deviated <laughs> septum. I'd say that most, uh, most patients do have a, a mild deviated septum to some degree. Um, not something that necessarily needs to be addressed unless it's causing you any symptoms such as trouble breathing, nasal congestion, frequent nosebleeds, or anything of that type. So what, what would you have seen if I were to have um, an allergic rhinitis versus that sinusitis? What, 
pathology would have told you that one was there versus the other? So we often see that uh, this very boggy, swollen edema look of those inferior turbinates. Sometimes it even has a little bit of a blue tint to it. That is a classic look with, with, uh, uh, with allergic rhinitis. The, the, the mucosa inside your nose, the lining or the skin of the nose in, in your nose, it looked healthy. People with allergies, that is, that's a very swollen structure and there's lots of clear drainage. Um, we'll often see in, in patients that smoke a very unhealthy look to the lining of the septum um, and, the, and the, the mucosa throughout the nose. So there's different mucosal changes that we can see. Uh, in addition to that, severe allergies or, or other reasons, people can have nasal polyps, which are grape-like growths that occur inside the nose. They block airflow. They make it easy to get sinus infections. They, they block the sense of smell, and um, they cause problems. So, you know, we talk about treatments, you know, one of the things, you know, um, I was going to ask you about, because I see it on the, I see these ads all the time, Dr. Peter said, um, uh, the, these neti pots, sinus rinses. Um, so are those effective? And if so, like, uh, how, how does that work? They're very effective. They are one of the first uh, conservative uh, first line treatments that we, we use for multiple nasal pathology presentations. I recommend most of my patients with nasal pathology to, to try them. Um, it's essentially using salt water or, or nasal saline to, to rinse and flush out the nose. And there's a lot of benefits to that. Um, it, it, it physically cleans away dirt, debris, allergens, viruses. Um, it improves the health of the lining of the nose. It's a natural decongestant and opens up the nose. And it also thins out the mucus. So it's nice and thin. It can move right through the nose and flush to the back like it's supposed to. So how often? How often should, you know, if that actually is effective, these saline rinse, is that something you do multiple times a day? Do you do it every day? Do you just do it during allergy season? Uh, what, what are your recommendations for that? Sure. So um, if you're sick with a virus, a cold, the standard cold, probably a good idea to do one or two per day. Um, and there's, there's many over-the-counter kits that you can buy for these to mix them up um, that you can pick up at any pharmacy. I have a home recipe that I give to patients to mix their own at home, and I have patients use this after sinus surgery. Um, so if you're sick, that's something that you might want to do every day or maybe even twice a day. Um, if, if you're not sick and having lots of nasal problems, a sinus rinse is something that you could just do as needed. So I'm often recommending to patients to use them after being outside all day around the, the allergies and, and the, 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 the allergens. Um, if you've spent the day working outside in the garden, working in the mulch, or maybe you spent the day working in the basement or in the attic on a home project, you're exposed to a lot of irritants that they sit in the nose and cause irritation and cause problems. The, 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 the nose swells and makes drainage. So to do a flush and rinse those away at the end of that experience is, is really nice and healthy for the nose and kind of promotes good health for the nose while avoiding all of those allergic rhinitis type symptoms. And, you know, it's, it's amazing, you know, how much the nose, I guess, you know, the, these, the, the, the vibrissae, those nasal hairs or whatever, capturing the mucus because, you know, I'll be out, you know, doing chores, you know, around out, outdoors. And it's amazing how you blow your nose and just all the grime and the dirt and stuff that gets in there. So, so basically you're saying when I'm doing that, it'd be a good idea to like maybe use one of the sinus rinses. Absolutely. Yep. Flush that away. And uh, I'll say one, one last topic that impacts the nose that most don't think about is, is your hydration status. M mucus in your nose is meant to be watery thin and you need to be really well hydrated for it to be thin and flush away. When people are not well hydrated and they, they either don't drink enough fluid, maybe some of their medications make them dehydrated, or maybe they just drink a lot of caffeine and not enough water. All those things added together really can make the mucus in the nose very thick and sticky so it doesn't move well. It gets stuck and causes more problems than, than, than good. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. I, I think in this country, you know, we, we're not hydrated enough. We don't drink enough water. Um, and I know I'm bad about that. And I know in the GI world, you know, one of the things we see is a lot of constipation. People aren't drinking enough water. And I didn't really think about that, even, you know, with your sinuses and, and then how that affects your, your mucus production. So um, looks like we're going to need to take, you know, one more break. I really appreciate this sign exam. Uh, for those watching the show, stay with us. Um, we're going to take a commercial break and then we'll be right back from Doc Talk.
At Plateau Medical Center, we have the newest technology, which is robotic surgery. Prior to us getting it, you would have to travel out of the area into a larger hospital. By using the robot, less pain, quicker recovery time, quicker return to normal activities and shorter hospital stays. This new robotic platform allows us to do what we do and do it even better, and that's only going to benefit our patients. It's not about the technology, it's not about the robot, it's about patient outcomes. And now, Doc Talk, brought to you by Plateau Medical Center. Here's Dr. Paul Connolly. I'm Dr. Paul Connolly and you're watching Doc Talk and I uh, just want to thank Dr. Peterson you know for basically doing this science exam you know here in, on, in your office on site and uh, I really appreciate that and I really appreciate you coming in and explaining this so you know, as we get ready to close I just want you to maybe just you know talk just briefly again about sinuses, allergic rhinitis, sinusitis, and just some, some closing thoughts. Sure, well, I guess first off, thanks for coming in. It was a pleasure to have you. Uh, you were a great patient uh, with our nasal endoscopy exam. Um, closing thoughts, um, I think that there are a lot of nasal and sinus pathologies that patients, um, other physicians, um, mix all together, and they think that it's all the same stuff and all the same thing, and, and it's not. Um, the important thing to get the right treatment is to figure out what the root problem is. And that includes seeing a, a specialist in the area, um, getting the right examination, which in, can include a nasal endoscopy like we did today, um, potentially uh, x-rays and CT scans as needed, um, and, and getting the right workup. Um, and then as we fast forward to the patients that need a sinus surgery, I would just make the statement, not all sinus surgery is the same. That's another misconception. Um, not all surgery des deserves a septoplasty versus a sinus surgery. Um, surgery is customized to the patient. And, and, and that's my goal to, to offer to patients. I'm a keep it simple kind of a practitioner who I like to break things down and provide the treatments that make sense. Well, I, I really appreciate one doing this exam because first of all, it was totally painless. Okay, I didn't feel anything, and the amount of information you're able to obtain, you know, in that brief segment, I think was very valuable. And I just want to tell you, Dr. Pearson, we're glad you're here. Uh, I appreciate you coming on the show, and I just want to tell you, you're always welcome uh, to come back. And any other topics, anywhere from the head down to the neck, you know, I'd like to have you back sometime. That sounds great. We'll plan to do one. So for those of you watching, I appreciate you watching Doc Talk. And until next time, have a good night.